Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about um, distribution or equidistribution. of nil sequences. Um, I'll remind you just quickly what a nil sequence is shortly. Um, but really, I'm going to be talking about generalizations of a very, very well-known fact. So generalizations and quantitative variants of the following very well-known fact. Which is that um, if theta is a real number, then the sequence of values theta, two theta, three theta, etc., is equidistributed mod one. if and only if uh, theta is irrational. So I'm going to be generalizing that to polynomial sequences on arbitrary um, quotients g mod gamma. Here I've just got r modulo z. And I'm also going to be interested not in the whole sequence up to infinity, but in finite segments of it. And all of that with a mind to applications next time and the time after. So let me just remind you again what this thing called a nil sequence is. So recall, uh, we have a simply connected nilpotent Lie group. G, which has on it a proper filtration. G bullet, and that's a collection of um, it's a collection of closed Lie subgroups of G, which satisfy this commutator inclusion property that I mentioned before. And then I define this notion of a polynomial sequence. And we defined in several different ways. Uh, which I didn't show to be equivalent, but I stated it, the notion of polynomial sequence P of n, uh, P from Z to G. So I won't go over that again. I did it last time. And you don't really need to know what the general definition is this time. So the basic question I'm going to be interested in is when is, uh, let me take a lattice gamma, let gamma be a lattice, uh, if I have a finite set of values of that polynomial. So when is P of n from n equals 1 to big N close to equidistributed in the quotient gamma mod g? And what does this even mean? 
So that's a question I'm going to be interested in. Um, well, to motivate this, maybe I'll give you a few examples. I've already had one. So let me first of all <coughs> say that uh, the example I, I put up there actually generalizes. This is perhaps a less well-known fact. It generalizes to arbitrary polynomial sequences. So if g equals r and uh, gamma equals z, and if p is just any polynomial, So I think I, I briefly mentioned last time how to make the traditional notion of a polynomial compatible with uh, this slightly fancy notion to do with filtrations. If the polynomial has degree d, you just take the first d elements of the filtration to equal the whole group, which is r in this case. So if p is any polynomial, then um, p of n is the whole sequence is equidistributed. Um, if and only if the polynomial has at least one irrational coefficient other than the constant term. other than uh, the constant term. Uh, so this is not so trivial to prove. I may say a few words about it later. So the proof uses Vars inequality, which I will mention later. So Vars inequality will tell you that if the polynomial is not equidistributed, then the lead coefficient is irrational. And then you'd have to iterate down to show that all of the other coefficients are irrational as well. Uh, so it uses Vars inequality and an iteration. Um, and there are theorems in ergodic theory. So a theorem of Leon Green, no relation of mine, I should point out. Uh, and this is about equidistribution of, of flows on nilpotent groups. So if G is uh, nilpotent, so a simply connected nilpotent Lie group, And if P is uh, a linear sequence, so P of n is a to the n for some a. So that is qualifies as a polynomial sequence with the definition I've given. Then the conclusion is, so P of n, uh, n equals 1 to infinity, is equidistributed. What does equal distributed mean? Well, I'll be going over that shortly. But uh, let's just say for the moment, with respect to the Haar measure, so with respect to Haar measure, on gamma mod g. Uh, well, if and only if, the, the only way that a sequence can fail to be equal distributed is if it fails to be equal distributed in an abelian projection of g. So if and only if the abelian projection of p fails to be equidistributed. Um, so what I mean by that is that you have g, and you have a natural projection 
to G mod its commutator. And the sequence P projects there. So this will be isomorphic to just a Euclidean torus. And when you project P, it will be isomorphic to a certain uh, rotation. So the projects to a, a map pi composed with uh, P. So this induces a map so on a torus. So let me give an example with the Heisenberg group. Yes. I think the parity of the number of negations in the sentence. <laughs> so if and only so it it is equal distributed. If and only if the abelian projection is equidistributed. Exactly. Thank you. I think it's best if I give an example. So, example uh, if G is the Heisenberg with the usual lattice. And if A is just some element, so if A is 1, 1, 1, alpha, beta, gamma, uh, then the flow that's induced on the two-dimensional torus by that is just rotation by alpha and beta. So the induced um, map on the torus r mod z squared is given by uh, p tilde of n is alpha n beta n. So you have Leon Green's theorem is the non-trivial fact that the sequence a to the n in the nilpotent group is equidistributed if and only if this sequence is equidistributed in the torus, which by Kronecker's theorem is the same as saying that alpha and beta are independent over the rationals. So alpha, beta, and one are independent over the rationals. By Kronecker's theorem, uh, this is equidistributed. if and only if 1, alpha, and beta are linearly independent over Q. So that's a complete criterion for when a nil rotation on the Heisenberg group is equidistributed. So I'm really going to be interested in quantitative variants of this. And even to say what I mean, I should give a bit more discussion. So, are there any questions so far? So quantitative equidistribution. If you want to make things quantitative, you have to quantify the notion of close. So let me introduce a parameter. Let delta greater than or equal to 0 be a, um, a parameter. Well, if somebody asked you how should I define equidistributed on the circle? Probably the first thing I would say is it's a sequence that 
spends the right portion of time in each interval. Um, it's slightly problematic to use that as a definition because what should be the analog of interval in a more general group? Uh, so we don't think of it quite like that, but we think of the interval, the characteristic function of the interval as a, as a function, as it is. And then equal distribution is saying that averages of our sequence along a function are close to the integral of that function. So we say that a sequence uh, P of n, so it will always be for us a polynomial sequence, taking values, well, the sequence P of n is delta equal distributed in gamma mod g if, so when you look at the average of this sequence weighted by any function on, um, so this phi will be a function on g mod gamma, and then you compare that to the integral with respect to Haar measure, then that's at most delta times an appropriate norm of the function. I'll tell you which norm in a moment, where here, for every, uh, let's say for every smooth automorphic function on G. So here, we put the Haar measure on gamma mod G induced from the unique Haar measure on G. And uh, normalized in such a way that the total volume of this quotient is one. So the measure of the whole space is one. And these Haar measures are not too difficult to understand. In the Heisenberg group, it's actually just dx, dy, dz. So in Heisenberg, uh, the integral is simply uh, with respect to dx, dy, dz. So the Haar measure is just the product of the Haar measures in the three coordinates. So you won't lose much by thinking about that case, or even just the circle case for now. Um, it doesn't matter hugely which norm you take. I mean, if you change the norm, it will change the notion that you're dealing with, but in relatively minor ways. So for technical convenience, it's actually useful to have um, our norm to be one of those Sobolev norms that I mentioned last time. So we'll take the norm so you just take it to be a sufficiently high Sobolev norm and I think I found that the Sobolev norm with 2 to the s times the dimension of g derivatives was enough but that's really a technical matter in fact you could just look at first derivatives of phi and every function with bounded first derivatives is basically Lipschitz or well, it is Lipschitz and it can easily be approximated by much smoother functions. So it's really just a technical point. Anyway, the basic idea here is simply that you're comparing space averages and time averages. And that's how you decide whether a sequence is close to equal distributed. <laughs>
Questions on this? Okay. So a crucial result on, well, I suppose the main result that I want to talk about is a more or less complete statement about when a polynomial sequence on G mod gamma is equal distributed in this sense. And it generalizes is really the examples that I showed you above. So the main result, uh, a generalization of the above examples to, well, first of all, uh, to polynomial sequences on uh, gamma mod G. Um, and with this quantitative notion of distribution. Now, maybe I should say, well, I should say, so Leon Green's theorem is it's valid for any simply connected nilpotent group and for any linear sequence on that group. If you instead want a polynomial sequence, that's a more general result. But it turns out that actually a polynomial sequence can be lifted to a linear sequence on a much bigger group. So actually, you get the polynomial equal distribution result for free from the linear one. But for various reasons, that's not, that argument fails you in this quantitative setting. So I thought I'd mention it, but I don't want to place any emphasis on it. So what I do want to do is state precisely this main result, and then I'll sketch some ideas of the proof. So here is a reasonably precise statement. And it seems to be a bit of a theme in these lectures that the most I can hope to do with precision is state results. I guess that's uh, sometimes things are difficult. So theorem, let the notation be as above. Uh, let's suppose that P fails to be delta equal distributed. from 1 up to n. Uh, well, then, the expl there's an abelian explanation for that. And I'll write down what it is. There is a horizontal character. So I'll introduce a few terms that I will explain later. A horizontal character, eta, from g to the reals, um, mod z, such that what we call the smoothness norm of the abelianization Um, of P is bounded. So this bounded by delta to the minus a constant where the constant depends on the group. So I have a lot of things here to explain. Um, but if you don't wish to take too much notice of, what, of my explanations. This is a, an abelian obstruction to a sequence being equidistributed. So here, um, pi is projection from g to g mod. Um, actually, sorry, I don't, with, with the way I've defined it here, I don't need the pi. This will automatically be a uh, 
So I just have to tell you what a horizontal character is. So here, uh, horizontal character just means it's a homomorphism. So it will automatically annihilate the commutator subgroup G brackets G. And it also is supposed to annihilate gamma. Um, and this smoothness norm, so thus, e to compose with p of n, well, it's going to be an r mod z valued polynomial. So it's a polynomial map, let's call it f, um, from the integers to r mod z. And so I can just write it in the usual way that I write polynomials. So this will have the form f of n is alpha naught plus alpha 1 n plus up to alpha d n to the d. And this smoothness norm is basically telling you how close to being rational all of those coefficients are. So to say that, so the statement um, that f in smoothness norm, c infinity of n, is at most m means Well, it means that those coefficients are very close to integers. It means that alpha j in R mod z, which is the distance from alpha j to an integer, uh, is at most m over n to the j for every j. So that's a lot to take in. Let me tell you at least how it specializes down to just even some abelian settings. Uh, before I do that, I, I said that this, this smoothness norm is telling you that those alpha j's are close to being rational. Actually, it's telling you that they're close to being integers. Um, to somehow, that's enough because you can always multiply eta through by an appropriate integer um, to make things that are close to rationals close to integers. So let me give an example. An example. Just with g equals r and gamma equals z. Uh, the sequence theta n squared from n equals 1 to n, fails to be delta equal distributed um, if and only if uh, theta is very, very close to a rational. So if and only if there is a q the integers such that uh, the distance from q theta to the nearest integer is bounded by delta to the minus constant over n squared. Where is the q coming from? Well, multipl multiplication by an integer q is the same thing as one of these uh, horizontal characters. Let me just write that. So eta is multiplication by q. So this is a known result. Um, this follows from Viles inequality. Uh, but this is not the usual way of phrasing Viles inequality. Actually, it's the way that I prefer to, when I'm lecturing on Viles inequality, I would prefer to state it this way. I find the usual way a little bit confusing. I don't know if anyone's familiar with the statement of the inequality. It's a, it's a statement about certain exponential sums. 
with polynomial phases. But it's really saying precisely this. So a polynomial sequence and when it's equidistributed. So does anyone notice something that's lacking in that statement? Well, I, I, sorry? Well, it's a bound on Q, yeah. As stated, it has no content whatsoever, right? Because every, every theta, by just by Dirichlet's pigeonhole principle, for any theta, you can find a q. It might have to be very big, such that theta times q is close to an integer. So I additionally need a quantification um, to give this content and we also need to place a bound on the complexity of this horizontal character eta. That a certain complexity quantity So the complexity of eta. And um, as before, this has got to be measured with respect to a basis on the Lie algebra, curly B, uh, is bounded. So I don't want to go over again what the basis was and how you define exactly this notion of complexity. Um, but in this particular example, it just degenerates to the size of Q. So in the example just given, Uh, it's a, it's a, it asserts a bound on uh, Q, mod Q. Also, Q should not be zero. Otherwise, it's, again, completely trivial. So it asserts a bound on the size of Q. In this case, uh, well, the, the size of Q is, again, bounded by delta to some power. So to state the theorem precisely, I would need to include also um, some bound on the complexity of this horizontal character. So let me just write explicitly uh, what the content of this theorem is in one phrase. So P of n can only fail to be equidistributed for a billion reasons. You probably also need a power of delta on the left hand side. Delta to k equals one. Power of delta where? On the left hand side of the, of the equivalence, because you could replace delta by delta. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Let me just, OK, that's a good point. The notion of equivalence in this sort of discrete setting is, a, is always a bit, you don't quite get back to where you started from. Um, so there is a, an if and only if, but if you go that way and then back, delta will have become delta to some bigger power. So let me just phrase it like that for now. So here's the basic idea. A polynomial sequence, the only way it fails to be equal distributed is for a billion reasons. Now, I want to say a little bit about the proof, obviously not very much, because it's a, this is a really difficult theorem to prove. But the proof uses a trick well, it's more than a trick, a technique that is the same technique that's used in the proof of Viles inequality. And that's called the van der Korput um, lemma. So the main idea of the proof 
So following vial, and this is not, so this follows vial, which is a paper in analytic number theory. It's not the same thing that Leon Green does in his paper. Um, but by following vial, we will we use what's called the van der Korpen lemma. So the van der Korpen lemma um, asserts a relation between a sequence being equal distributed. Well, the original van der Korpen lemma, so the original version of which. asserted uh, a link between um, the distribution of a sequence, the uniform distribution of a sequence uh, un, mod 1, and its derivatives. which are un plus h minus un. Uh, specifically, if all of the derivatives are equal distributed, then so is the sequence. Uh, so that would actually immediately give you qualitative equal distribution results about theta n squared, because the derivatives will then be linear sequences. And then you can just apply the known results on linear sequences. Um, here is our take on van der Korpert inequality, which is very standard. Um, suppose you have just any bounded sequence. So suppose that a n, n equals 1 to n, are complex numbers. of norm at most 1. And suppose that their average is not close to 0. So suppose the expected value of a of n is at least delta. Then the conclusion is that many of the derivatives have the same property. Um, So I'm going to state a precise version, even though I'm certainly not going to prove a, a precise version. So suppose that big H, slightly technical condition, big H lies between and big H is neither incredibly tiny nor quite as big as N. Then we have that the average value of many of the derivatives is at least delta squared over 4 for many values of h. Just remember how many. The 4 and the 32 clearly don't matter. So for at least delta squared over 32 times h values of h. Sometimes I find it less confusing, I don't know if you agree, to put in explicit constants rather than unspecified absolute constants when they're not too big. So the statement is, if you've got some bias in a sequence, then also many of its derivatives are biased. Uh, let me sketch the proof. Uh, well, the idea is that if h is small, and that's going to be guaranteed by this inequality, then averaging um, the average of an is very close to the average of an shifted by h. 
I mean, they're averaging essentially the same thing, except you've got some slight edge effects. So many of those averages are uh, Well, so then it's basically the cauchy schwarz inequality. So you can choose just some phases. So let's choose some unit complex numbers, zh, expected value n less than or equal to n of a n plus h is bigger than delta over 2, let's say, for an appropriate phase um, zh just to make it real. Um, so if you average that over h, so the average over h less than h, and the average over n less than or equal to n of z of h, a of n plus h, is also at least delta over 2. And now you apply cauchy schwarz So by Cauchy, the average over n of the average over h a n plus h squared uh, is at least delta squared over 4. And if you expand that out, so that implies that the average over h1 and h2 less than or equal to h of the average over n less than or equal to n of n, a n plus h1, a n plus h2 bar is at least delta squared over 4. Well, you can see that with a bit of messing around, you'll get the statement that I wanted. Every average on the inside here is basically uh, like the average in the statement of van der Korpet's inequality. So this is roughly the expected value over n less than or equal to n of a n, a n plus h1 minus h2 bar. And then you just have to count how many times each h1 minus h2 occurs, so et cetera. Uh, but that's, the basic idea is just one application of cauchy schwarz after you've done a shift. Questions? The other key idea is also a key idea, a very famous idea that is um, due to Weil, which is that to understand equal distribution, you, could, you should expand into Fourier series. So the other crucial idea is Weil's idea of uh, proving equal distribution by expanding into Fourier series. Or put another way, we had a definition of equal distribution, which sadly I've erased. But the definition was about an arbitrary function phi. And you just need to check that definition on a basis um, of well, L2 of gamma mod g. So check the definition um, so check the definition of equal distribution 
only for phi lying in a basis. of uh, L2. Now, of course, it's not quite enough to just check things. If, if you're dealing with a quantitative question, you can't just check things for a basis and then hope that the same statement will hold when you add basis elements together. But as long as your way of decomposing into these basis elements is suitably effective, which it will be if the functions are highly smooth, then that's more or less the case. So. What Vile did, famously, in the case of R mod Z, uh, it's enough to check it So it's enough to handle Phi of T being e to the 2 pi i m T for m in the integers. And as I said, you do lose a little bit in the delta. So this causes some slight degradation, some slight change in delta, but um, just a power. Um, so I'll go through that in the case of nil sequences in just a second. But let me explain how it works already in the case of, say, theta n squared. So if you want to test the dis distribution of theta n squared on the circle, it's enough to test it for e to the 2 pi i theta n squared. And if that average happened to be large, then you could apply the van der Korpert inequality and get that many derivatives of that have to have large average. But a derivative of e to the 2 pi i theta n squared is just a linear phase function which is just a geometric series. So it's quite easy to evaluate that. So what's the appropriate variant of, that, of this Fourier expansion in gamma mod g, g mod gamma, where g is a nilpotent group? Well, of course, that's a, that's a very deep question in general. But actually, it turns out we can get away with a, a fairly simple answer to that. We're not going to look at a sophisticated way of decomposing this space. It's actually just enough to do a Fourier expansion in the vertical components. So in the general case, a similar trick works. Um, to test equal distribution for an arbitrary phi, you decompose it into Automorphic functions with a, a vertical frequency. So to test equidistribution uh, against an arbitrary phi in C infinity of gamma mod G, it's enough to handle uh, the case when phi has a vertical frequency psi, um, which, let me remind you, means that phi of, if you twist x by an element of the last group in the filtration, then it has a natural transformation property under psi. And the reason for that simply is that there is, um, you can do a Fourier expansion in the direction of this group G. So as I mentioned last time, 
phi can be expanded as a sum of automorphic functions with a vertical frequency. And of course, all of this would have to be done quantitatively. But I shan't bore you with the details of that. So suppose you've done that. And suppose that you have now a function that additionally has a vertical frequency. So suppose that psi is a non-trivial frequency. then that, that means, just as with the non-trivial exponentials on the circle, the integral of this function with respect to the Haar measure, because of the vertical oscillation, it just cancels out and you get 0. So what does, what does failure of equal distribution mean in this case? So if p of n from n equals 1 to n fails to be delta equal distributed, with respect to uh, this particular automorphic function with a vertical frequency, then it just means that the average is at least delta. Well, actually, at least delta times the smoothness norm of this function, but I'll suppress that. So this is something that we can apply the van der Korpert lemma to. And by van der Korpert, there are many h such that the same average but now with an additional term of phi of p of n plus h is at least some constant times delta squared. Now I don't know if anybody remembers what happened last week but you can see that something very similar to what happened in the proof of Weyl's inequality has happened here. So for Weyl's inequality, van der Korpert took a quadratic phase function and by differentiating it, made it linear. And what is the derivative of a nil sequence? Well, I spent a whole hour explaining that that is a nil sequence of class one less. So we can turn this into an induction uh, by this device of taking derivatives. So by the main discussion, by the discussion of, um, I think it was mainly in lecture three, uh, the object here, phi xi p of n, phi xi p of n plus h, bar for fixed h, so it is, for fixed h, a nil sequence of class uh, at most s minus 1. So what this means is that you can imply, you can hope to prove the main theorem by induction on the class. So this offers the possibility. proceeding by induction 
So this is very special to the case of these nil flows. One can consider flows on G mod gamma in other cases, for example, where G is SL2R um, and gamma is a subgroup. But the same sort of trick just wouldn't work. I mean, you'd get, this would not be a simpler object. In fact, it would be a worse object sitting on G cross G. But in the nilpotent case, we do have this simplification. So that's the main idea of the proof. But you still have to actually carry out the induction. So carrying out this induction is uh, rather difficult. And I just want to show you, just give you a glimpse of what happens in the Heisenberg case so you can see the way in which it's difficult. Um, so let me actually revert completely to the notation of last time. So let's set chi of n to be this nil sequence. And then in the notation I had last time, delta sub h of chi is precisely the derivative. So last time I said that this derivative is a nil sequence of class S minus 1. Um, well, actually, let me, let me specialize also to the case of the Heisenberg, just for illustration. So G is the Heisenberg. And, um, and the polynomial is just A to the N for some N linear. So I said last time, last time we saw that the derivative delta H chi of N can be thought of as a nil sequence of class 1. And I wrote down precisely what those actually I wrote down the general form. So here uh, P sub H delta of N is P of N plus H. And so it's P of N, P of N plus H times P of naught, P of H inverse. And that's actually, in the linear case, it's just the same. It's just the diagonal flow A to the N, A to the N in the linear case. If you calculate, very easy calculation. And the automorphic function phi phi sub h box of n was phi times phi bar of x, y, p naught, p h, which in my case is uh, phi of x times phi of y times a to the h. And here we come across a serious issue, which I alluded to last time. So. I'm trying to prove a statement about equal distribution by induction. But the statement I'm trying to prove is quantitative. It cares about how smooth my functions phi are and how Lipschitz they are. But unfortunately, this a to the h here could be huge. Um, I said nothing about how a is bounded. This could be an absolutely enormous element in the group G. Um, 
So there's no guarantee that this automorphic function has any nice control at all. So a could be huge. And a to the h could be huge. Um, so no control on phi h square. So the induction won't work unless you do something to get around that issue. And what you need to do is to insert a conjugation by elements of, uh, of the lattice gamma. So to get around this, we can conjugate by elements of gamma cross gamma. So here, uh, maybe I'll just show you how to modify this to do that. Um, so you can put a, you can conjugate this by an arbitrary gamma, gamma h. And this has the effect of adjusting the automorphic function in here. So put, um, maybe to explain this, I did a computation last time explaining why the derivative of a null sequence could be written in this form. It turned out that there's extra flexibility inside there that I didn't make use of. You can do this conjugation in any way you like, and you have a, a different representation of the derivative in this form. And so this will then become uh, delta h. I can take gamma naught equals 0. Uh, gamma naught is the identity. So I get to multiply a to the h by any element of the lattice that I like on the left. And by doing that, I can make it small. So by choosing choose gamma sub h so that uh, gamma sub h a to the h lies in the fundamental domain. So in particular, we'll have all of its matrix entries banded by 1. And so when you do that, you do then recover control uh, on this automorphic function here. Unfortunately, you've made the problem more complicated. So you had to do this to make, to get yourself a, a derivative function that's got bounded smoothness norms. But you've made the polynomial, the derivative of the polynomial more complicated. So p sub h is now, well, it's rotation by a, by the diagonal a a conjugated. So it's delta sub h, gamma sub h, um, a uh, gamma sub h inverse to the n. So now you can imply the inductive hypothesis. This is just a rotation on a, a torus. So it's a rotation on a torus. So I, I introduced this torus last time. It's what you get by applying the constructions I showed you last time on the Heisenberg. And it's a three-dimensional Euclidean torus. And so by Kronecker's theorem, uh, we have, well, Essentially, the coordinates of this vector, a and the conjugate of a, uh, fail to be independent over q. 
So the coordinates of A gamma H, A gamma H inverse, uh, well, reduced to lie in this torus, so reduced mod G2 diagonal, uh, fail to be independent over Q for many values of H. So it's an abelian problem, but it's a rather complicated one. So you have to somehow go from that assertion to saying something about the coordinates of A itself. It's a difficult matter to go from this to a statement about A. But it can be done. Um, I think it's, well, I'm not going to go into any more details. The, the, the paper in which this is done is difficult. But at least you're reassured that you kind of know it has to work if the theorem that we're aiming for about distribution of nil sequences is correct. And that's because this van der Korp is almost an if and only if. So it's not, you haven't really lost anything apart from a few powers of delta in going through all of this machinery. The expansion into Fourier series, again, it's more or less an if and only if. So this is a, it's kind of a, a weird sort of integration problem. You've taken derivatives and you have to deduce, it was easy to take derivatives, but the statement you ended up with when you did that is quite difficult to integrate back again. And I should say, it's the same problem with the proof of the inverse conjectures for the Gower's norms. So I showed you last time why, why nil sequences are obstructions to Gower's uniformity by induction. So I said, if a function correlates with a nil sequence chi, many of its derivatives correlate with derivatives. And then it, I was done by induction. But to get the converse statement is much harder. So Many of the derivatives of f correlate with a null sequence, but you have to then deduce from that that f itself correlates with a null sequence. So it's a similar sort of issue that's difficult there. This is not used in the book, the inverse scales. It is all over the place, actually. Yes. Uh, for in the case of the u4 norm and higher, uh, this is used everywhere. I mean, I didn't use the inverse conjecture at any point here. This is purely an, almost an algebraic fact, really. I've said nothing about Gauss norms. Okay, so you need this quantitative redistribution result yeah. in, in the proof of the inverse conjecture. Yeah. For the U4 norm and higher. Right. And do you need it as well um, later on? I mean, from the, no, that's really for, for the inverse conjecture. It's needed, this is really, this is somehow key to the entire theory of higher order Fourier analysis and null sequences. It's also needed, crucially, in showing that, well, tomorrow I'll be talking a bit about the primes. Um, and there you need to show that the Merbius function is orthogonal to these null sequences. And again, this theorem is a crucial ingredient there. And it's somehow quite fundamental. Um, well, just to finish, I want to say two things about how this is applied. So why, I haven't really said anything about why I should care about equal distribution of nil sequences. So why do I care about this particular notion, equal distribution, of polynomial sequences on gamma mod g. So there are two reasons for that. And the first one is that essentially every sequence is equidistributed. So every p of n, 
is almost dis equal distributed. I'll say a little more about what that means in a moment. Um, but it means that P, an arbitrary polynomial sequence can be decomposed into some very benign pieces, a periodic piece and a very smooth piece, plus an equidistributed piece. So somehow the equidistributed case is pretty general. And then secondly, if P of n is equidistributed, then we can, uh, we can count various linear configurations. So if I have time, I'll give you an example. So e.g., the average of, I can count, say, four term progressions involving nil sequences. Let me make this r. p of n plus 2r, phi of p of n plus 3r. And it will be, it, I get a very algebraic answer. It's an integral of phi to the 4 over a certain subgroup called the hall petrescu group, HP4 of G uh, modulo. So this uh, where HP4 of G which is a subgroup of G cross G cross G cross G, is a certain group, explicit group, called the hall petrescu group. The hall petrescu 4 group. Um, And actually, that, this generalizes. There's nothing special about arithmetic progressions. There's a, a corresponding result for any linear forms, which is called the Liebmann group. Um, let me tell you what the whole Petrescu group is, because we've already seen it in action. E.g., when G is so when G is R, but with the filtration. So I'm going to put a degree, a class 2 filtration on G. Uh, then the hall petrescu 4 group, HP4 of G, is uh, it's a subgroup of R4. And it's the set of all tuples x0, x1, x2, x3, such that x0 minus 3x1 plus 3x2 plus x3 is equal to 0. And we've seen that before, um, because I've already, we know an example of a polynomial sequence here. Would just be theta n squared. Um, but the, the example I showed you before was where theta was root 2. So let's give that example. And we noticed before that there's a constraint amongst four-term progressions uh, in this function. So I, I mentioned that when I was showing you that traditional Fourier analysis is not enough to handle four-term progressions. And what this theorem is saying is that essentially that's the only constraint. So it's saying that the four-term progressions are inside the, this function equidistribute over the set of all four tuples satisfying this constraint. So um, in a sense, so n squared root 2 minus n, 3n plus d squared root 2 plus 
3 n plus 2 d squared root 2 minus n plus 3d squared root 2 equals 0 is the only constraint on four term progressions, four APs in P of n. So these equidistributed sequences are very nice. Actually, I lied to you slightly. Uh, that's false. You actually need a slightly more elaborate notion, a stronger notion of equidistributed called irrational. Uh, it's quite technical, and I, I don't feel inclined to say what it is here. In many cases, for example, for, for these linear sequences on the Heisenberg group, the two notions coincide. So to finish today, I'm going to explain what I mean by this statement. What do I mean by every polynomial sequence is almost equidistributed? Uh, well, this is basically a generalization of what's called the Hardy-Littlewood method. So Hardy and Littlewood were concerned with, well, things like polynomial phases on the circle when they were thinking about Waring's problem. And they decomposed those phases or the coefficients of those phases into major and minor arcs. And um, so in other words, they basically said every, every number is either essentially rational or it's not rational, it's irrational. And that's essentially what's generalized by this assertion here. Um, so let me explain point one, is uh, really a generalization of the Hardy-Littlewood idea of decomposing into major and minor arcs. And in fact, the, this Hardy-Littlewood idea can be seen as the special case where G is the circle, uh, G is R of this. So a more precise statement so given an arbitrary polynomial sequence I can write it as a product so I can write P as epsilon times P prime times gamma prime this is a pointwise product of polynomial sequences Uh, where epsilon epsilon just varies very slowly, smooth. So that means something like uh, the. I mean, some on on the group measured on the group in some way. Uh, it, it just doesn't vary very much. So this means essentially that you can always use some standard tricks in analytic number theory like partial summation to just ignore it. And then gamma is rational. And that means that um, basically that gamma is periodic. modulo the lattice for some small q. Um, and again, in practice, that means you can get rid of gamma 
uh, just by or just by splitting into subprogressions of common difference Q. And then finally, P dashed is equidistributed. It's highly equidistributed somewhere. Um, not necessarily in G. I mean, the P could just be trivial. P could be identically equal to, it just could be the identity always. And then obviously, you're going to have a hard time saying that anything related to it is equidistributed on G. But P prime of N is highly equidistributed somewhere on some uh, G primed mod gamma with uh, G primed contained in G, a closed connected subgroup. And as with all of these statements, a proper quantification of this is quite technical. Um, you need to say what you want by highly equidistributed. And you get to choose it to an extent at, the, at, at a certain cost. Um, and then you get to control the complexity of the G primed, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a much more precise statement that needs to be made, but this is, the, this is what's true in spirit. So in the example I mentioned where P is constant, this decomposition is trivial. So epsilon is also constant, gamma is constant, and P primed is constant. And it's highly equidistributed in, well, where G primed is identically one, the identity. Um, and then the other extreme would be where P is already equidistributed, and then you could take epsilon and gamma to be trivial. So just to finish, let me explain oh, so how is this proven. And this point is why, this is the reason that we have to deal with polynomial sequences rather than merely linear ones. So the way this is proven is by induction on, downwards induction on the dimension. So if P is already equidistributed, then you've got nothing to do. Stop. Otherwise, the main theorem I've been talking about today tells you that there's an abelian explanation for that fact. And what this means is that P is basically near, it sits inside a proper subgroup. So you then get to induct downwards on dimension and that will eventually stop. So the proof is by downwards induction on dimension. Uh, using the equidistribution theorem. And let me give you an example of what can happen when you do that. So e.g., again with the Heisenberg, suppose that you take uh, p of n to be a to the n, a linear sequence, uh, where a is 1, 1, 1, theta, 1, 0. And here, theta is of size about n to the minus 3 halves. Uh, so you can compute what a to the n is. a to the n is 1, theta, n, 1, 1, n, and then uh, a half theta, times n times n minus 1. Now, a n, a to the n, n equals 1 to n, is not close to equidistributed. And we know by the theorem that there must be an abelian explanation for that. But in this case, it's staring us in the face, because the x-coordinate never really leaves zero here. So 
it's visibly not, not close to equal distributed because theta of n is stuck near, very near to zero. And so if I follow through this idea of in downwards induction on the dimension, let's restrict the whole setting to the group where x is zero. But then a to the n is no longer a linear sequence. It's then a polynomial sequence with those entries. So this can turn a linear sequence. So p of n turns into a polynomial sequence. upon restriction to x equals 0. So in fact, it's a polynomial sequence on an abelian torus in that case. So what this point shows is that um, you have to work in this category of polynomial sequences in order to be able to make any of this work. Just the linear sequences don't have enough closure. They don't have this. It's essentially the group property of polynomial sequences again. I mean, a to the n times b to the n is not of the form c to the n in the non-abelian world. OK, so that's what I'm going to say about that. There are two lectures left, and um, they will only tangentially rely on this and not on the details of this. I think next time I'll talk about Semerides theorem, cases of that and some variants of that. And then last lecture, I will talk about applications to the primes. But that's all for today. Thanks. Um, questions at all? Quick question. Yeah. So in, in number two over here, yeah. um, the, you, you apply the equal distribution theorem to um, to the product, to the whole product. Yeah. Right? Yes, and you, to do that, you need a two-variable version of the equal distribution theorem. So instead of just a, a sequence indexed by n, you need a sequence indexed by n and d. And actually, so the paper in which these results were proven is this paper, Quantitative Behavior of Polynomial Orbits on Null Manifolds, Annals of Maths 2000 and, well, it says 2012, but this paper was written in 2006. And recently, we discovered that this was wrong, the proof of that multi-parameter version. So it, it's now been corrected, but it, it was wrong for six years, actually. Um, and hence, actually, all of the, in a sense, the proof of the inverse conjectures was, I mean, it was wrong, but fixable. But yeah, that's what's needed here. <laughs>